So leather industry is the ultimate recycler, and, but it's just been doing it for so long that everybody forgot. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sustainable Talks with NNM. Today, we have Steve Strotman from LHCA. Good morning. Ciao. Finally, Nico, finally, we go to the source of the material. Eh? We, we and... touch all the other part of the finish of the material tannery tonight. We can really go to the beginning of the process. Thanks for setting our invitation. Most of the leather that we all use come from the U.S., so it's going to be fun to know facts and figure about the U.S. market. Yes, let's start with our common question that we do to everybody. What, what is, is for you sustainability? <laughs> for me, honestly, every time I watch one of your episodes or I read some something new from on the sustainability front every day, but my definition changes because it's just it's such a wide area and it just and it gets wider and wider and wider, right? For me, it is being able to to do whatever you're doing, whatever it is, producing a product or a system or something for doing that in perpetuity so that you're, you are not taking away from future generations ability to do that. What does Leather and Hide Council of America do? Leather and Hide Council of America is the, tra- the primary trade association in the U.S. for pretty much the entire leather supply chain, starting at the meat packer and then moving through the hide processor, the tanner, the chemical company, and down to some some leather brands as well, you know, brands that are that are heavy leather users. It's a new association because we we merged uh, two previous associations uh, about a year and a half ago to do this. Uh, so we have kind of a unique purview of looking at everything along the supply chain. We try to represent our members' interests in any any field that will be affecting uh, their their business. So I. I have to wake up and be an expert in a, in a brand new topic every single day, you know, put it on a different hat because, you know, one day it's legislation and another day is a trade issue or sustainability or, or, you know, what have you. So, but I think uh, if we're doing our job correctly, we bring a lot of value to our members in those companies by supporting them, you know, in, in those efforts. And how many members are you representing? Yep. Uh, about 75 member companies and about 50 to 55 of those would be, producer companies, so whether they're producing hides or producing leather or, you know, producing the chemicals. So actually in the business of, of producing so, leather. And it's everything from, you know, the, the big giant meat packing companies all the way down to, you know, the family owned hundred year old tanneries. You know, I mean, it's, it's wow. everything kind of in between. So it's and a lot of perspective. Can, can you give us a, an idea of the value? In terms of the industry, it's about a $2 billion. I think the last time we did some view around 15,000 people were employed in the industry. And it's almost all for export, right? Almost all for export. Yeah. So especially on the hide, the raw material side, uh, 95% of the hides produced in the U S will be exported That's in some, you know, whether it's salted or wet as wet blue, or, you know, even, even a little bit further finish, but at some point it probably will leave, leave the U S our largest market is China, of course, being the, one of the largest leather producing countries. That's where a lot of our footwear leather will go, uh, hides for footwear, hides for, uh, upholstery, for sofas and, and furniture can be half of our market. You know, they, they could take half of our hides. After that, it's Mexico. Uh, Mexico is a huge market for us because of the North American kind of NAFTA region um, and, and a lot of the circularity taking place there. Uh, the auto industry in, in North America largely works out of Mexico for a lot of their manufacturing. So that's where a lot of our hides will end up. And then of course, Italy. Italy continues to be one of our largest uh, markets as well. Faction figures, you know, can you give us some insight just to share numbers? In total, we have about 94 or 95 million head of cattle in the U.S. Living cattle, yeah. And about one third of those animals will be processed for meat each year. And then one third will be replaced. So we, our slaughter levels are about 33 million head per year, 34 million head. Uh, and when, when you break that down, that's about 600,000, 650,000 head per week. What are the states that are the biggest states producers? Usually it's in the middle of the country. So those are the largest beef producers. So Texas, uh, Colorado, Nebraska, those are some of the largest states. There's cattle in every single state. So, you know, they, 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 they're obviously born in every single state. California is a huge dairy state. So we have a lot of dairy cattle coming out of California. But even Florida, I mean, you south of Florida, you think of Florida being alligator country and there's still yeah. plenty of cattle down there, you know, and it's actually really kind of funny when you visit, if you visit a cattle ranch in California, they say one of the, the biggest problems they have to face is alligator eating calves 
that are out. Oh. In the, yeah, yeah. So they and they have a lot of ranches will hire specific game wardens who their job is to go find these alligators that are eating their cattle and get them out yeah. and you know go go relocate them. Yeah, kind of interesting. It, we had with Lydia Pelle once we did a webinar with all the Louisiana government where they were saying how many crocodile there are there now. It's, I think it was 4 million out of 5 million population. Yes. I can imagine that they are going out eating cows too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a success story though in terms and I'm sure that I I watched that episode. I you know, I know that was a conversation point. Yeah. It's a success in how they've been able to bring that population back, you know, I mean the, know, for yeah. for the alligator. Yeah. So it's it's a good problem to have that you have so many of them now that you know, you don't want them eating your cattle, but that means no, we have plenty of them. Story, so. It's a success story of the industry and how the industry set up rules to manage themselves, but to take care of the animal. And this is part of their animal welfare story. You know, feats of sustainability, one of them is economic. I mean, you, you do have to make, make this economically viable to be sustainable. And that's a perfect example of it. If you have to have that market for those skins in order to make it economically viable for these these farmers and these these harvesters to take care of this population you know and when you set it up right and when you do it correctly it's beautiful it works it works fantastically yes because actually yesterday we had this uh, clubhouse with the scan hide where of course out of denmark it's very small country it's very easy but they are able to trace the leather until the farm so through a qr code in the shoes they know all the life all the supply chain and that was amazing and we asked them, is it a scalable system? And they were like, uh, actually, yes, it is. You need to really to believe. Of course, there's a lot of complexity out there in maybe Brazil or US, but it is possible. So we wanted to ask, what do you think about, is it possible to trace the material now or tomorrow? It's very complex in the US, unfortunately. It's very, very complex. Traceability is one of the more complex topics we deal with. Some hides, yes, you can trace them all the way back, um, but it's not the majority by any means. Um, and, and there's a couple different reasons why. And this goes back 150 years, right? This goes back to cowboy, cowboy days on the open range. We don't have in the US a federal uh, animal traceability system, a government, federal government run traceability system. They have it in Australia, they have it in a number of different countries. You know, it, a cow is born, it gets a birth certificate, you know, in the year or whatever, and then that's, it travels with that throughout its life. We don't have that in the U.S. Um, and instead, what we have is a lot of state-based regulations on the cattle in those states. And we do have a federal system that will catch some of the animals in, in the tracing system if they cross states. But if, if an animal is born and raised and never leaves the state, it won't end up necessarily in that in that federal system. So what we so what you end up with actually then is a, is a patchwork of a lot of different types of traceability systems. Some of them, if you are very well situated, you know, working with the, with cattle from some of those systems, you probably can get back pretty far using that. But if you're using cattle from 20 different states, you've got 20 different traceability systems. Some are better than others. You're not going to be able to get necessarily the the, the transparency that you that some people in the leather industry would really like to see. In terms of what it is going to look like tomorrow and, and in the future. I do think that's going to that's going to get better and that's going to change. And that, and it's because the cattle industry, you know, the, the cattle producers do understand fundamentally that traceability is a good thing and they and they understand it's an important thing. They look at it more from the animal disease perspective than they do from obviously hides or leather. Uh, you know, they want to know, okay, well, if foot and mouth disease or some some bad disease like that is introduced into the United States, they want to know how they can do social distancing, coordinate and do all that kind of stuff. And you know, all the stuff we all know how to do now because of the COVID. But now you get into these questions of who's going to pay for it? Who's going to own the information in the, in the database? There is still a lot of questions between state regulatory regulation and federal regulation. And, you know, do the states hold on to that data? So now it's more of a logistics question than it is a, a spirit of, do I, do I want to do it? Yes. How do I do it? That gets trickier. And, and you have to put historical con context around some of this. I mean, some of these states, yeah. they, they fought a civil war over things like this, you know? So yeah. it's, it, there's a lot of history there that, that's in that tension between federal government and state government. A good example of that is, is uh, branding, hide branding on, yeah. on the cattle. Four, 14 states require it by law so that you can, you can show ownership over that animal. 
And the banks in those states, in order to lend money to the, to the, the producers, require them to also put the brands on because they want to, as a bank, they want to know that their property, that they're, you know, that they're, they're funding, they're financing, has the ability for them to, you know, go find it, go see it, go repo, you know, repossess it if they need to, that type of thing. So, you know, so we don't have a federal rule on branding. How does your member position within animal welfare? There's a lot of work and investment and time and resources that have gone into animal welfare in the U.S., the problem is they didn't talk about it to anybody outside of their own industry. So no, nobody is aware about any of these programs that are available. So for example, there's a really big program on the live animal side on farm called the Beef Quality Assurance Program, BQA. And it's a very prescriptive, very specific uh, information about, you know, the animals shouldn't, you know, the, the horns, they shouldn't have horns so it doesn't stab each. It should, should you know, if you're going to brand it, it should be branded in a certain location so it doesn't hurt the animal. And, you know, it, it's very specific rules. 85% of the U.S. cattle are raised under this program, but nobody outside of the cattle industry has ever heard about it. One of my jobs and one of what I've been really trying to do, especially in the last two years or so, is get that information out of the cattle industry and start moving it into the leather industry and into the fashion industry. Because I, I, there, these are two silos that aren't talking to each other at all. And so there's all this activity taking place and there's nobody connecting the dots. How, how the, let's call it, trend of sustainability is impacting your work. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a secret. The leather, in, leather industry has had a really rough time in the last five or six years, you know, especially. It's been, a, it's been an industry that has uh, had to catch up to uh, what is happening in the sustainability space very quickly. It's definitely benefiting the industry in terms of now the industry is starting to think from a more... CSR perspective, sustainability perspective. Okay, what do I need to do due diligence wise in my supply chain to make sure that I'm delivering a sustainable product to my customers because that's what they're demanding. The, on the other side of it though, what's been interesting is fashion has a little bit gotten out ahead of the reality of what the leather industry and the cattle industry are um, and are doing. So for example, there's a lot of people who obviously don't want to use leather for various reasons, animal rights reasons, whatever. So they've replaced it with synthetics, plastics, you know, these types of things. And they are marketing it as, oh, we're going to save all these cattle lives. And it's like, well, no, 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 that you're, you're not impacting a single animal by, by putting all this plastic in this material. You, those hides are still going to be there. They're not going away. So from that perspective, I think, you know, some parts of the fashion industry got out a little head of the reality and, and need to kind of come back in. And we need to meet in the middle somewhere and say, okay, well, the, leather industry and, and the cattle industry are doing all these things on sustainability to, to be more sustainable, but we, we need that information to make its way into the fashion houses that are, are making their materials choices so that they understand it's, well, what kind of an impact they're going to have on their own supply chains when they make those decisions. That whole idea of, of the hide being the byproduct, since that hasn't really sunken into the fashion side of the industry, where they really fully understand what that means, you know, that means that the fashion industry is not really looking at the whole animal, they're, they're looking at only the hide and, and what, what that means for their industry in terms of sustainability. But for example, if you're looking at the whole animal and what the reason for that animal existing is to produce food, then all of a sudden you have to look at that animal from a sustainability perspective with a much wider lens than just the hide and, and what, what it means for leather purposes. So for example, if you don't want animals that have been raised in a feedlot system for, you know, for example, for whatever reason, Okay, that's fine. I understand that that leather coming out of a feedlot for certain fashion brands doesn't make sense. But that fashion brand is not looking at the reason that the feedlot exists is because of food production. We get more food out of that animal. So who who loses out now that you don't have that extra food? There are ramifications to these types of decisions that the fashion industry is not looking at because they're not in food production. You know, I have my personal explanation on this, and maybe I'm wrong, from most sure I'm wrong. And I think that the fashion industry is using this because PU or vegan leather is cheaper. So it's convenient for the fashion industry to use PU than leather. But that's my uh, personal uh, theory. That's my personal opinion too. I, I think we all share that personal opinion and I, I don't think it's limited to the fashion industry by any means. We, we, we see that in the auto industry as well. In a lot of people's minds and, and, and in a lot of marketers' playbooks, vegan equals sustainable. You know, they, they, they have been able to make this case and it doesn't. And, and you know, you're, you're shaking your head. It, it doesn't. You can make plants 
very unsustainably. You know, look at the palm oil industry. Look at you know, look at areas where uh, you know rainforests get wiped out for fruit production. You know, purposes. Know, sure. You know, there you can you could produce a lot of vegan material extremely unsustainably. So vegan <laughs> does not equal sustainable. What will happen to the industry if tomorrow? everybody become vegan take it outside the, the perspective of the industry what would happen to humanity how much hunger would be reintroduced into humanity you know i mean especially on the very poor you know very poor populations where the only nutrition they are able to get is from animal products if all of a sudden you're trying to replace that with soy based plant you know materials and things like that that's not going to make its way to some of the poorest populations in the world so all of a sudden you're you're going to have a massive amount of hunger so The, obviously, the industry would be devastated, but humans would be devastated as well if all of a sudden you took that out. There was a really interesting study that uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture did. It was a couple years ago. They looked at the exactly that question. They, they, they said, what would happen if the entire U.S. agricultural system went vegan? And they, they looked at a couple different metrics. And one was uh, greenhouse gases. And they, they did see, okay, there was a, a small reduction in greenhouse gas uh, because Obviously, cattle are, are, are a contributor to that, but food insecurity, nutrient unavailability went way through the roof. And all of a sudden, the U.S., which is a net exporter of food, is now a net importer because we can't produce enough nutrients for our own population. So wow. there's all of these kind of external issues that, that come up when you start having these very big discussions of like, well, let's just all go vegan. It's like, well, it's not that easy. There's going to be a lot of other unintended consequences that come out of that. <laughs> Do you guys have any LCA about meat producing or leather producing? What do you do around this? We're getting into that. We're starting to do that a lot more. We've been slow to the, get in that game, frankly. We, we should have had an LCA for our industry on this three years ago. You know, the LCA thing and, and, and just the, the debate about carbon emissions has been really interesting for our industry. And it, it relates to leather and cattle because cattle were so demonized so quickly as the, you know, the cause of, uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions and this and that. And, and when you start peeling back the, the rhetoric and you look at the actual data, you know, in the U.S., cattle are only 2% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And the grass sink, the sinks that come from the grasslands that they're feeding on is 11%. So it's a negative. So it, that can, you can balance that industry very quickly and make it carbon neutral. But everybody's been focused on only the, the one part. They've been all focused on the emission side and they haven't looked at the entire cycle. And that's, that's why we need... Uh... Uh, more education, we need more perspective. You know, they, they think that me and Nicole, we are trying to do, we say it always, we are trying not to be integralist, like pro-leather or against leather, pro-vegan or against vegan. No, we need to have a perspective, anti-bias uh, point of view. Steve, leave us with uh, your last thought. Leather is the very first form of recycling humanity ever came up with, right? If, imagine if today, you invented the leather industry where you were, you had all this waste hides that were just going to a landfill. And then somebody came along and said, you know what, what happens if we put all those waste hides into a drum, move it around a little bit, you know, take it out and make this great material that we can all now wear and use. And oh, by the way, that material is going to last for decades. It's beautiful. It could be used in 20, 30, 40 different applications. This would be, you know, the World Economic Forum and, and, and Bill Gates and everybody would be saying this is the greatest sustainability, you know, success story we've had in, in years and years and years. But we've been doing it for so long that everybody, you know, nobody thinks about it in that respect. The leather industry is the ultimate recycler, and, but it's just been doing it for so long that everybody forgot. So let's remember that. Let's remember how good we are as recyclers and, and, and not break something that's not broken. So, <laughs> Steve, thanks a lot for... Your time was great. Love your passion. It was a great conversation. I had fun. Bye.